This is the Fleet Success Show, dedicated to helping you and your fleet succeed using the experience of fleet professionals and Hall of Fame fleet legends. The show that explores how the pillars of stakeholder satisfaction, intentional culture, resource efficiency, and risk management all combine to lead your fleet to success. We're glad you're here. Now, let's get into the show. Okay, so not very much M&R savings, right. which is, you know, was kind of sad when I saw that because I was like, oh, this is the thing. And and I'm just going to call this one out too, because this is the first comment I know we're going to get. Yeah, but you don't have to pay for oil and you don't have to pay for an air filter. It's like, yeah, but you still have to replace the cabin air filter and you still have to replace, you know, the HVAC components and all that. It all exists. And in fact, recharge that air conditioner. And a Tesla, <laughs> that fan runs all the time. All the time. I don't know if you ever walk by, but like our VP of sales we talked about, yeah. he drives a Tesla. You always think he left his car running and it you're is. like, oh wait, it's a Tesla. <laughs> it's just running, no yeah. stop. Yeah. <laughs> I see the same thing happen. It scared me once overnight. Uh, we had a car in the garage and it's like, what's that noise in the garage? And yep. it was the car cooling itself off. Essentially. <laughs> You're in Arizona. Like this is something we deal with guys. <laughs> okay. So let's look at this five years overall. Right. Right. You have the conventionally fueled vehicle. It depreciates 4,200 bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, another conventionally fueled one. You know, this is the tracks com depreciates 9,200 bucks. Compare that to the EV. Right. So it, you know, the bolt EV over same five year period will depreciate twenty two thousand dollars. It's just massive. I mean, twenty two thousand versus forty two hundred. Right. Twenty two even ninety two hundred, right? Like let's be fair here. Ninety two eighty with the tracks, which is kind of more comparable to the bolt. Yeah, and that's fine. Uh the Chevy Volt depreciates sixteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Uh and fuel savings, you know, fuel the CFVs are definitely higher. You know, we're looking at for the tracks, ten grand almost. Right. For the bolt, we're you know, spending about three. Mm -hmm. You know, seven seven grand right there. Yep. Um, M&R costs a little bit more expensive in the tracks, a little less expensive in the bolt, uh, by about two grand, right? Call it. So two grand, seven grand, that's nine. The delta between depreciation is 13 mm -hmm. and a half. So overall getting an EV is going to cost me about 4,000 more for the life of the vehicle. Yeah. I, Just little, based on that math? Yeah. A little more than that. I think. Uh, I guess we're almost five. Yeah. yeah you total all of it up. Five, right? Yeah, you know, the Chevy Trax comes out to 24761 total capital cost. The Chevy Bolt comes out to 30000 mm -hmm. ninety-five. So almost not quite a five, I guess a little over five, 5K difference between yeah. the two. And if you're going to be as particular about the details, and again, I'm not trying to beat up the EV, but I just want to be honest about the nature of these vehicles, the Spark is probably a better comparison, right? It totally is. You yeah. Know? yeah. It, well, especially if you could compare it to a Spark EV. Yeah. And that's a really an apples to apples, which is right. nice. Yeah. If you compare that, so, okay, so the Bolt is definitely the outlier here. That's 30 grand. Yeah. Uh, there's no question. If you that's... compare the tracks to the Bolt, that's almost dollar for dollar. Yeah. I you know, think the it's a fair thing. Yeah. I think the biggest difference though is the, the you know, while you're saving significantly on fuel um, and you're saving some on the m &R, like that depreciation is just killer. Right. Right. Like that's, if you're doing this to save money, this isn't saving you money. You're just no. using an EV instead of CFE. But Correct. The, the cost is almost identical. Right. Uh, and that's kind of like your best case, worst case scenario. If you compare that still to the Spark, which is a very fuel efficient vehicle. Right. And on the market today, this would be equivalent, like you could go get a Prius hybrid. Yeah. Something like that. Right. Or or even just, you know, like a, a what is it? The Yaris or the, um, yeah. the Corolla, right? If you want to not even pull hybrid into the conversation. Right. And so uh, you look at the Ford, you know, C-Max and the Chevy Volt, both of those are almost 24, 25,000 compared to the Spark at 17. And it's the depreciation. Right. You know, it's the fact that they, they really does hold on to its value better. Right. Um, and, and we got, I got a call out here because we also have taken some hits for saying that we think plug-in hybrids are actually a pretty good sort of intermediary place here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can't help but look that the plug-in hybrid and the hybrids, their costs are landing very similar to the conventionally fueled tracks. And, you know, we did get a, a really nice um, jump in emissions reductions here, right? Yeah. So, it, so you traded why depreciation for fuel, and that sounds. And if the benefit is lower greenhouse gas. Yeah. Why is that demonized? It sounds like a win to me. Yeah. I, yeah. I, that's the one that makes me scratch my head the most. When, when, if for some reason, some of the evangelists uh, demonize plug-in hybrids. I don't. If it's not battery it. EV, it's not EV. I, I that's guess. what we're. That's what I've heard. Right. right. That's what I've been told. Right. If it's not battery, it's not EV. Like right. plug-in hybrids are terrible. They're atrocious. Da, da, da. Yeah. And when you consider most folks won't go beyond the range of those plugins. In their normal commute, like it's like I, I I just don't get it. I think it's a really great option, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's a good extender option, right? It really, if is. you need to go a little bit further in the range, 
that's where the, the hybrid comes in. Right. Um, if you're not quite ready to flip over the entire fleet to EV and right. install the infrastructure that comes with that, because that's a cost we haven't even talked about. Yeah. Uh, but if you're not quite ready to do that, then well, the plug-in hybrid is a great yeah. intermediate. Uh, and even if you are ready to do that, but you just want to get started right away, like one of the problems that we run into when we're advising fleets is you, you cannot bring in that first EV without the infrastructure to charge it. And right. if you do so, it's to your own peril because you're going to end up increasing the size of your fleet. It, so it's a whole thing. But with a plug-in hybrid, you can order that vehicle today yeah, and not worry about when the infrastructure is going to get in, right? I mean, obviously you want it to get in sooner, but when you, you build can, it, you can like be you'll, have, you'll be able to use it when it's built. Right. right. And you can get all the gains of the efficiencies, right? Okay. So it's like hybrid. Yeah. yeah. So again, I don't. This don't is a no greater transition it, plan it, it, as far as you and I are concerned. Yes, it, it really is. Certainly much yeah. easier. Okay. All right. So comparing this, you know, 15,000 miles per year, comparing the Spark versus the Spark, right? These are both LTs, CFE versus a BEV. Right. Uh, MSRP for the conventionally fueled vehicles, 15,000. Uh, but the battery electrics sub- almost twenty seven thousand, uh, and that's the big significant difference. Right. When that vehicle sold, right, this is a fifteen thousand mile per year, so this is more consumer grade. More consumer grade. Yep. The conventionally fueled vehicle will keep about twenty two percent of its value. We'll sell it for thirty three hundred. Right. Um, overall capital cost, right, which is again the delta between what I acquired it for and what I disposed of it for. Right. Comes out to ten six. Estimated fuel cost, fifteen five. Capital and fuel cost together cost me about $26,115. Right. The battery electric only retains 14% of its value. Still retains more, right? So I can sell this for $3,900. Right. So about $600 more than right. I can eventually fuel the vehicle. Right. But I started at almost $27,000. Right. Which means my capital cost was almost $23,000, right? At $22,779. Estimated 10-year fuel cost, only $6,500. So half of what the... Uh, uh, conventionally fueled vehicle was right, but that still makes my total capital fuel cost twenty nine two seventy nine right for a fifteen thousand mile per year vehicle right. Uh, it's costing me about three grand more for the life of that vehicle five right. years. So so this idea of like you know I'm going to save all this money when I buy an EV it's just not there. just not accurate. It's not there. It's not like it's going to cost you an arm and a leg to right. do it. So if you really care about you know like oh I just want to reduce my own carbon footprint. And you want to shift it from, you know, coming out of your tailpipe to come out at your electric utility. Mm-hmm. By all means, this makes sense. Right. Okay. But let's talk about the more likely scenario for a fleet, which right. is going to be 5,000 miles per year. Right. right. Lower usage, shorter runs, yeah. that kind of yeah. thing. Like I said, if, you, if you're if you hitting six, 7,000 in fleet, uh, you're doing great. Again, there are vocational fleets that maybe that it's going to look much more like that consumer use. So yeah. we put them both. Now they will hold on to their value more. Mm-hmm. Right. But we noticed that the Spark, CFV retains 50% of its value. Yep, pretty much. Whereas the battery electric only retains 30%. Right. Uh, so the capital cost alone, 6,400 versus 18,616. Right. So that's almost a 12K delta. Uh, fuel cost, 2,100 versus 5,220. Again, the more you drive an EV, the more it makes it worth it. Correct. But fleets don't drive their cars as much. That's the so 5,000 miles means you're not capitalizing on all the savings that an EV could give you which means that your overall expenditure for, you know, five years, this is the same model. Yeah. Right? Just the last one was a 3K difference. Right. By driving it less, our capital cost is 20716 for an EV, 12745 for a battery or for a conventionally fueled. Right. Right. So that comes out to an almost identical eight grand delta between the two. Right. Where are you going to make up $8,000? Exactly. And so, you know, on both of those slides, we put kind of this hypothetical where let's pretend you never had to do a PM for an EV to try to see like where, where are some places we could make it up, right? I mean, uh, you know, if you're only driving to your point, the less you drive it, the less fuel, but also the less M and R, right? Yeah. So, um, where are you making this up? It's not in PMs, even if you don't do any PMs on the EV, which again is bad practice. We're not saying that, but we wanted to kind of try to be fair here. Are we, you know, because obviously we understand that for many folks, the, the attitude is, well, you should never need a PM for an EV because the onboard computers will tell you when when something is wrong or, yeah. you know, some thought of that nature. Tell your lawyer you said that. Let's see what they say. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> but anyway, we're trying to be fair. We're trying to, um, you know, and it, we're trying to position this in a way where we've considered the angles of reasonableness, right? And yeah. So hopefully, folks, that's coming across here. Yeah. And so, but even if you cut out your PM schedule, let's say you cut it down to like one per year instead right. of doing two or three per year. Right. Right. Uh, all you're cutting out when you talk about the 
uh, you know, the actual oil and parts of the oil and airfield, I mean, maybe a hundred bucks, maybe, you know, depending on the price of oil that day. Right. But, you know, the time that you save maybe a couple hundred bucks in right. inspection cost. Right. Depending on your fully burdened labor rate. Well, in, in this case, right, let's say you're, you're purely outsourced. So you're paying, yeah. let's say you have no deals and you're paying retail. So let's say you're paying a hundred bucks for that PM, which I think is a fair number. That's cheap. Right, which is if cheap. you go to the dealership, like Ford, no, charge you two fifty. Oh yeah, yeah, three hundred bucks for. So a again, year. I'm trying to, you know, what we what what did you save? You know, a thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, uh twenty five hundred dollars. Like you're not making up the eight thousand dollars. Like I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't see it. I, I know if you get into a crash, fine, but that, that's totally different. That's your insurance. We're not just to make that clear, right? I, I it's a tough, it's tough to make it up. Show me the money. <laughs> it's not there. It's not there. It's not there. Okay, yeah. let's keep going. Oof, this is a busy slide, so I'm just going to apologize right now. There's a lot of data here. You can pause it here if you want to and just read all the data. Right. What we're trying to show is just the delta between the actual cost of, you know, like a class group 1320, well, these are NAFCA, NAFCA class codes, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, right. So looking at it, it's the auto that's compact, a sedan that's less than 8,500 GBW, typical CFV. Thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. The EV alternative. Well, it's only three of them worth thirty three thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Yeah, some of them we're going to do better. Uh, yep. Yeah, but if you jump down to I don't know, pick a line here. Yeah, maybe pickup trucks. You know, you got your extended cab, three quarter ton extended cab for thirty five thousand. Well, it's a cheap yeah. SLT. I mean, it's a work truck, right? right but even yep. then, if you get the the you know Lightning Pro, like this, the base level Lightning, it's seventy thousand dollar truck. Seventy thousand dollar truck. Yeah, without the frills. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Chevy does the same thing. I know they're, you know, like the Chevy, whatever they're calling their avalanche, the Avalanche, the Silverado EV. Yeah. That's totally just an avalanche guys. Come on. It, it is. But I got to tell you, I rented one and the thing was freaking awesome. That's what convinced you to buy an EV. It is. It is. That, yeah. It was awesome. Right. I won't lie. It, it drove around like a little compact SUV and, and it was this big truck. Yeah. But you're it. just looking at, you know, Chevy Blazers, Ford Lightning Pro SSV, right? I mean, you're talking 70, 55,000. Police interceptor hybrid sixty two right, and every one of them is just a little bit more expensive or a lot more expensive. Yep. Uh, and very rarely will you see a flip the other way. But it's actually more expensive to buy a CFV right. than it is to buy. It happens, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically it. And what we want, I want to call out on this slide is in in this case, we were uh, working with a, a fleet organization that was only interested in OEMs, which which you know you could at least understand their position, whether or not you agree with it. Yeah, you know they're thinking, okay, if I do aftermarket stuff. Uh, who's going to service it? How do I train my folks on it? And by OEMs, we're talking, you know, Ford. Right. Uh, oh gosh, GM and Stellantis. Yeah. Right? And, and again, the even, even, the even if some. Some two, I know, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, even if you go HD, you know, Freightliner now has some out of the box EVs, but, um, you know, for a lot of fleets who are either out of their choice or because of mandates or because of whatever it may be, um, that's not an option to go only OEM and they're being told, no. It's got to be everything. I think you mentioned it with some of the California fleets. So the fact of the matter is that in the MD space, medium duty space, and large chunks of the heavy duty space, not the entire, heavy duty is actually ahead on medium duty here. Um, th- it just doesn't exist yet. Right. Right. I mean, a- an F-150 Lightning is great, but that's the equivalent of a half What does product. exist is significantly more expensive. Well, that's what it is because you're talking aftermarket certified in many cases. Yeah. But you're talking someone took a chassis. And ripped it apart and made it into an EV, right? And you're seeing, I mean, dramatic differences in the cost of these assets, right? Like four X, like the- like four X, or and and you know, and and even when it's not four X, when you look at it from like a just a dollar amount, the impact on, on your plan is going to be huge. Like I, we did a study a couple of years back for a group that included transit, right? And the, at the time, I want to say this was two years ago, maybe three years ago. They were buying their diesel buses for just under six hundred thousand dollars, five hundred eighty something thousand dollars. To get those same things as EVs was going to cost them at least one point two million, in, in the range of one point two, one point four. So not four X, two, but a dramatic, dramatic difference on what your cash flows need to be. Right, right. You just cut your replacement budget in half. Right, like you know, essentially, yeah, you're going to need twice as much replacement budget to stay on top of that. And that's if, and this is to be clear. The use case works because in that case it did. They were not a 24-hour transit, so they could charge overnight. Right. Imagine if you're a city that runs 24 hours, right? You're going to actually also need to increase the quantity of your fleet 
your spare fleet in order to we're not going to call that your charging. spare fleet. We're going to call that it's not charging. Yeah, it's your charging fleet. At that point, it really is because it's what's necessary for the logistics. And I know we're going to get the comments. Well, but you could do charging in route, and you could do battery swaps for some of these. And yeah, and until they invest in the infrastructure, you can do all that. But all that's going to just increase your cost somewhere else, right? Yeah. So again, I just call out that it it's actually a better story in the light duty space right now because the OEMs there is closer to. Yeah, charge par uh, cost parity there. The minute you talk about aftermarket upfitters, and I'm not trying to knock them because the, I think some of the work they do is frankly phenomenal. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it costs more. I mean, but even for the OEM, like let's talk about Freightliner. Even for their EV versus their non-EV, there's a significant mark oh, yes. for the EV. Oh yes, yeah, you know, and so and even if you could qualify for that tax credit, it's just not making a huge dent in yeah. that overall cost. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so it, this is like when we talk about eyes wide open, the number one cost is always going to be depreciation. And because of the delta in CFE prices versus EV prices, that the cost of depreciation is going to offset any kind of M&R cost savings or fuel cost savings right. you're going to get. That's right. You have to be aware of that and what that impact is going to look like on your CapEx versus your OpEx budgets. Right. Uh, so, and that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It just means you should know it. Before you do it. Before you do it, right? Um, and we, plan for it. And create a plan and, on how you're going to do it because you can't all of a sudden... We've seen that where, you know, there's a mandate comes in. They say, hey, we need to switch all of our, and this isn't like a statewide mandate. This is maybe just your city council or something like that. We need to switch over everything. We want to be the greenest city on earth. We're going to switch over everything to EV. Okay, this is what it's going to cost us to do it. Oh, hold on a second. Like, that's not what people said. This is supposed to be free. It was supposed to save us money. Right. If you can't tell that story, you're going to look like the bad guy. You're right. going to look like, oh, you're just a naysayer. Yeah, you're the naysayer. Right. And you got to just be able to explain, hey, this is where how much we're going to save on e on maintenance. This is how much we're going to save on fuel. This is what we're going to have to spend to get that. Right. And that's just from a CapEx standpoint. That's not even the infrastructure. We're not talking about that. That's not even, you know, if you can even get the charging stations, we're not talking about that. Right. Just the cost and the asset alone, you have to be transparent about. Right. And and again, I, I hate to beat it up, but... I, uh, we got to also make the point that, uh, frankly, there's just not an EV alternative for everything, especially in that medium duty and heavy duty right. space, right? Um, part of that cost driver, real quick, I want to call out is, you know, we, we, we talked about this uh, quite a bit when we're doing this, is that, you know, you may have an asset that you build, let's say, on a four-ton truck, maybe a five-ton truck, and it, maybe it's, uh, let's say, an aerial with outriggers, right? Because of that extra weight on the EV, you can't even build it on that chassis. You got to build it on a bigger chassis. Yep. Uh, and then that adds cost in addition to the upfit, in addition to, you know, and then can your drivers drive that? And, and it's just a whole big thing. And so that's, a, and you, again, you don't want to be the naysayer and say, we can't do it. You need to be able to prove this. And then last but not least, again, as of today, this should improve, but as of today, there's just not enough battery, <laughs> lithium, whatever you want to call it, to actually meet all of the demands uh, that are out there. So that might be a podcast for another day. But in other words, uh, you, you, the, the manufacturers are going to struggle to deliver uh, the, the quantity of EVs that are necessary to hit, to hit every, they, there's no way they're going to hit everyone's mandate. Let's put it that way. Right. You know, they might hit somebody's, but not everyone. They might be like a California. Yeah. Right. But if California and Illinois and New York all go the same way, and there's 17 states, by the way, that have signed on to carbon ACF. Right. So as go California, so goes at least a third of the country. And remember, there's the whole rest of the world, right? right. <laughs> a lot of countries have put in similar kinds of mandates. And again, you know, maybe we'll get there. It's great. If I'm them, I'm, I'm excited. I know that I have demand before I have supply. That's a great position to be in, but right. uh, it's, not, it's not an easy lift, right? So anyway. So, but okay, let's talk about this overtime. Right. So as we look at, you know, the EVs versus, you know, like we were doing this, this is actually, you know, numbers from a study we did for yep. a county. Uh, and they were looking at, you know, overall, how much would they be saving on fuel? Right. And cumulatively over 10 years, right? So from 2025 through the year 2034, they would save on average about $8.2 million mm -hmm. in fuel. That's not insignificant. No. Right. So $8.2 million in cumulative fuel saving. Cumulative, not on average. Cumulative. cumulative right. right. So not per year. Right. Cumulatively, they would have saved over ten years. They would have finally saved eight point two million dollars, right. which is significant. Eight hundred twenty thousand dollars a year on fuel. Yeah, yeah. But then you look at okay, so that's one graph, and I think this is the piece where we have to be really careful because you can take one graph out of context, right? And this is why you and I always say data has context, yes. and you have to look at it in comparison to other points of data, right? So let's move on from fuel cost. 
M&R costs. We've already kind of talked about this is that there's really not as much M&R savings as you think there's going to be. Cumulatively, over 10 years, we saw this fleet, they'd be projected to save $1.1 million. Right. So they're still saving money. Let's get clear here. You are still saving money on yes. M&R with an EV over so you are. Uh, at CFB. Right. It's 1.1 and you just saved 8.2 on fuel. So you, about right now, you're doing good? Almost a 10. Almost a 10. Doing all right. EO2, e, uh, CO2 emissions. Yay. Right, this, is, this is the big win. This is the big win. This is the big win. We have saved, cumulatively, in 10 years, 53.6 million pounds of CO2. That's a lot. That's a lot. Right, of tailpipe CO2. A tailpipe CO2, let's right. be clear. Right. We're not even measuring up. Uh, we, we didn't, this fleet wasn't interested in it, so we didn't do the work. <laughs> right. We can clearly show that you're going to reduce tailpipe emissions yeah, this way. There's no question about it. Better air quality to breathe. Yes. This will have an impact. Yes. And if we could, honestly, if we could come up with some good sort of thinking and design around where we put our uh, electricity uh, yeah. production, right? I mean, if we can put them, drop them in the middle of a jungle, for example, this would be a, a complete win, right? Because the trees would love it. It would be a great place. It would actually reduce the amount of carbon that actually escapes into the atmosphere. It, uh, it would be a tremendous win, right? So so there's some value. There's some value to moving the carbon somewhere else. I want to be clear on that. It's not... And I think that's one of the solutions that not a lot of people talk about. Right. You know, I, I look at California and I scratch my head because I know nuclear has gotten this just totally bad rap. Right? Which is and not... It, yeah. You know, like you look at it and we've had what? Chernobyl, three, Fukushima. Three pretty major incidents. Right, that's right. Three major incidents. Uh, several of them were you know, either faulty design, uh, totally gross human incompetence. Right. Which, by the way, if you've never watched the show on HBO, Chernobyl. Yeah. Either pretty of cool. that show. It's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And you just, you really learn how cool a nuclear is. Right. But also how stupid, you the, know, <laughs> the design can be sometimes. Right. Um, all to save a couple bucks here and there. But you think about, you know, California shutting down all their nuclear plants. Yeah. And you saw this in Europe, I just too. don't comprehend. Especially with their push to EV. Yeah. Right. Like, in nuclear, in my, it's the cleanest form of electricity today. It sounds renewable, but renewable is not as reliable. Correct. Right. Nuclear is steady, reliable, and clean. And not available everywhere. And not available everywhere. Right. Right. But if we were to, okay, like, well, I don't want to have a, a nuclear disaster in my community, right? There's, you know, I know you drive by, if you go from Carlsbad down to San Diego, there's a nuclear power plant that's right there on the shore. And I get it, but you move that inland, significantly inland, and we've got, you know, here in Arizona, people say, oh, well, you can't move it out into the desert. It's too hot. We got Palo Verde, literally 50 miles from Phoenix. Yeah. It is hot. Yeah. And it works great. Great. Yeah. Um, you know, and we, obviously we compare our, we also supplement with, um, no, uh, dams, right? What do we yeah. call that? Hydrogen. Yep. It's not hydrogen though. It's hydro, hydro dams. Yep. Uh, we have, you know, there are still some coal powered. They're getting rid of those. Yep. Uh, and there's still some natural gas, but most of it is, you know, it's going to be hydro or it's going to be nuclear. nuclear. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that's kind of the model that a lot of other places should be is how can we move this further away from right. the cities? And if we are going to be coal or natural gas or whatever, because we don't want to, you know, have a radioactive, whatever, how do we get that further away from the city? Right. And then you just run the lines. Yeah. Right. And that it's not as impactful to the environment or to at least, you know, where the people are living. Yeah. And again, to be balanced, uh, you know, when I first started looking at this, I just said, like you said, you're shifting it and, and we are reducing it. Um, but if you're shifting it, uh, it's kind of a lie. And I don't know if it's a lie, I, I, but I, I, there's, there's some fascinating study though. Yeah. To find know. out like per kilowatt hour, you know, for right. per pound of CO2 emission eliminated. We, we can do it. We've done it for some fleets and maybe we'll show that another time. All right. But there is downstream emissions. There is no question, but I want to acknowledge better to have those in most cases, in most cases, it's better to have those admit where they are. But again, it's not a, you're not eliminating emissions. That's simply not true. And it's just not true. Of course, then if you run power lines, you're going to kill some animals and that's, birds and that, stuff on the way in because you got to bulldoze some trees. Yeah. This isn't a win-win. Like, we just can't yeah. please everybody. Hey, this for, is... Google what's happening in Cape Cod over the last five or 10 years, and it'll kind of make you laugh with the the wind stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and the, Well, that's true, too. Like, you know, the wind is killing the birds. The wind's uh, killing the birds. And, we know, can't win. The hydro, the sea hydro is killing the fish. And, you know, uh, so anyway. Well, at least nuclear, you know, assuming it doesn't melt down, we just pile that crap in yucca. Yeah. Right. That just gets buried <laughs> in Yucca Mountain and 
Well, it, it, it'll just stay there for the rest of its life. It turns out there's a really great solution uh, with salt water and things like that. that it, oh, yeah. You know, so, and again, to, to your point, I, this is not an episode on nuclear energy. Maybe we'll do that one day. But if we're being honest, nuclear power plants kind of have that beta VHS thing going on where there's a better, smarter model that just, for whatever reason, didn't make it because, to your point, it was public perception. Yeah. Right. And there was that, you know, nobody wanted to invest in it. Nobody right. wants to spend money on a project that the public doesn't want. Right. Uh, there's still value in it. Right. Uh, I mean, Bill Gates is huge into this. Yeah. You know, um, I'll be honest. I think when nuclear fusion comes out. Yeah. It's going to be a game changer. Yeah. You know, if free unlimited energy, and it won't be free because you got to build the plant, but that yeah. it doesn't, it's just a game changer. It's yeah. completely different. Yeah. You know, from a, from a nuclear fission reactor. Yep. And that, that will be the thing I think that truly enables mass EV adoption. Right. You know, that, that will solve a lot of the infrastructure ails, you know, that, that what ails us there. Right. And let me just say this too, because we're going to get hit in the comments by some of the evangelists. Uh, bring what, it. what about all the other gas, greenhouse gases? And you didn't show that. And yes, we didn't show that. They exist. And we could show that. We did it because it's a podcast. And yeah. We only have time for so much, and the big talk is always carbon. Carbon is the number one killer and, and, and the bad one. You can show those, and I think that that's a fair point, right? The bottom line is there is no question that you've reduced tailpipe emissions a lot, and um, and you need to decide, is is what I reduced worth what that cost? 5.6 million pounds, is it worth the cumulative cost? And we're going to show you the cumulative cost, right. just how difference it is. For this case, yep. Because that's really what we're talking about here. Right. You know, It could be worth the cost to you. But make it worth the cost to you. That's it. Don't do it because you're going to save money or right. because, um, you know, it's cheaper or it's better or whatever. Like, do it because, you know, you know exactly what the cost is going to be and how much you're actually going to save. And don't give me some BS about, oh, this is zero emissions. It's not. Right. Be really clear about what that delta is. Exactly. And make that decision. Yep. You know, like, well, it's not 53.6 million. Now it's actually, you know, 20.6 million. Yeah. Is it worth it still? given that, you know, we could have done this a different way. And I think that's when we, you and I get hung up on EV mandates and stuff like that. Yes. There are options today that are not EV that could have the same impact for $3.6 right. million. Yeah. Somewhere along the line, the, the mandates changed from reducing greenhouse gases to adding, e, to. it's all about EV fleet count. Yeah. That's flipped. very troubling to me, right? Because yeah. I'm actually, you know, you can, you can Google me, you can go check. I mean, uh, you know, I was one of the first people around to introduce biodiesel in New York City as far as using it for a transportation fleet. Uh, I would love, you know, I jumped in on hybrids right away. I was an early adopter for all that. I'm, I'm a, you know, I've been accused of being a greenie. Um, so I'm, I'm all for, uh, you know, trying to improve the environment and make sure we, we, we take care of our earth. I think we, we're obligated to that. But why, why if all of a sudden the mandates don't, don't care about that, right? It's, so about, well, we just want to make sure all of our vehicles are now fleet or EV. Something's off there. Oh, great. Now here comes Mark. I'm going to go. You're going to get in trouble. Here we go. All right. All right. Let's move on because I'm Show me the money. <laughs> Speaking of money. All right. I got too honest there. Sorry. Right. So we talk about the, uh, the EV versus modified capital costs. Yep. Right. So this is a replacement pan we did for this fleet. Yep. And over the 10 years, if they wanted to switch to EVs, they were going to need to come up with an additional $18.5 million in their CapEx budget. Just for their assets. So I want to Just clear. to replace the asset. Right. Not the infrastructure. Not the infrastructure. Not anything else. Not the right. charging stations. Just the asset. Just the asset. Okay. Yep. So 18.5, you know, essentially they'd have to spend 7.5 million per year instead of 5.7, almost 2 million more per year mm -hmm. just to switch to EV. Correct. And that's just the capital. That's the difference in... Acquisition cost versus depreciation. Right. And and let, let me just call this out real quickly. One of the reasons we do this with fleets is because what we find is they're not spending, you know, we've talked recently about replacement. They're not spending what they should be spending simply to replace their assets. So this jump is actually bigger. So yes, it's about $2 million difference if for the conventionally fueled vehicle, right? If they were on track for their current replacement plan. Correct. This fleet, we don't have it here, but this fleet had been spending historically $1.8 million. Okay, so the jump from 1.8 to 7.5 is massive for this community. Yeah. Massive, you know. And the taxpayer is going to fund this because all the public, taxpayers. This are, is a government fleet that we're doing. A government this fleet. This is a this is a county in uh, northeast. And that's the thing we just want to be clear on is that hey, you can do it, but 
is it worth the squeeze, just, right? The just taxpayers, taxpayer. are, do they know that this is what they're signing up for? Correct. And does the city council know this is what they're signing up for? And what are they saying no to? What aren't they spending money Well, that's on? a big point. To spend money on this. Correct. That's so, a key, is it? Is it education? It's probably health, the money. It? Right. But it's got to come know. from somewhere. It's got to come from somewhere. Is it, is it purely just a tax increase or whatever it may be? It, it's coming from somewhere. <laughs> right. Okay. So overall, cumulative saving, let's, let's compare, right? Let's put this all in one picture. Yep. We're comparing the capital cost outlay, the M and R savings, right? Mm-hmm. Combining the two. If you look at this, yeah, I'm just going to focus here on this uh, last little piece here. 18.5 from a capex standpoint over 10 years, mm-hmm. and you're going to save 8.2, 1.1, right? So you're going to save nine, but you're going to spend 18. Overall, you're not going to save the money you think you're going to save. Yeah. It's going to cost you nine million dollars. Over the course of 10 years. In this case. In this fleet, this is what they came up with. Right? And this this was about a 1,500 asset fleet. It was a government fleet. And like we said, uh, with Back this, East, right? Back so, East, near DC, not, okay. not far from DC. Uh, and it's an OEM, you know, again, they're focused only on OEM, right? So this is only the assets they can replace with EVs because there's an OEM option that's fee- that's Place duty and all that. They weren't looking at remarketing. If it was you know, a heavy duty vehicle and it didn't have an OEM, you know, EV option, they didn't even consider it. It went out the window. Correct. So this could have gone up. Oh, this would have been dramatically higher. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I guess uh, bottom line here, Mark, right? This is kind of the end of our slideshow, but the bottom line is, you know, we want you to consider EVs. We want you to look at it. We just want you to look at it eyes wide open. That's it. Um, you know, do the research, do the homework, you know, start getting the plans in place to get chargers in your fleet. Uh, you know, work with your utility companies, get it going because it's not going anywhere. Right. It's just going to, it's going to keep coming. You just got to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to figure it out. And, you know, as, as my good buddy, Chris Schaefer always says, right. When he's not telling me that I, I don't know my butt from a hole in the ground, he's often telling me is that, Hey, we shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of good. And that's true. And a little bit of progress is better than nothing. And this is true. Right. Right. So, but you just have to make sure that is this the best use of taxpayer funds? Is this the best use of corporate finances? Right. Is there a better way, you know, if net net we could save, you know, 20 million pounds of CO2, is this the most efficient way to get there or is there a different way to get there? Right. And that's what we're really just challenging you as listeners to think about is, is this the best way to get there is doing a full EV swap or should we look at plug-in hybrids? Do we look at just, you know, upgrading our fleet? Renewing the fleet? We talk about replacement all the time. Absolutely. It's one of the best ways to improve your fuel economy, improve safety and all that just by staying up to date on your replacement plan, let alone swapping it all out for EVs right. or your hybrids. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, like I mentioned biodiesel, people are going to comment, well, biodiesel has its issues. Yes, it does. Absolutely. None of this is a fix all for everything. And that's the point, you know, we've, we've had fleets, some several great fleets in California, for example, that uh, have had tremendous success with natural gas and have reduced, you know, emissions dramatically in things like their sanitation and transit and I don't think there's a, I think if we really were caring about carbon emissions, probably the answer is we need a little bit of everything right now. Um, and, you know, uh, and, and, and unfortunately that seems to be going by the wayside for whatever reasons. That's the, it's the tribal identity politics. That's the, the one thing that I think if we could just think critically, yep. we would be looking at all options. Right. You know, how do we really get this done? And then, you know, as we go forward, let's say that we could switch out with whatever is available today. And then as we replace those vehicles and their three to five year life cycles or seven years, you know, as the technology adapts and all that, you know, we take another step forward and another step forward. Right. We don't have to bite the entire thing off at once. You know, we got to eat this elephant. That yeah. doesn't mean that we got to, you know, yeah. swallow the whole thing in one year. Yeah. And now YG, they're saying, well, it's 2030. That's still six years away. Yeah. Let's see. Still, when you talk about the challenges that we're facing, these are not six year challenges. No, they're not. You know, these are 10, 20 year challenges. Right. And hopefully, I think this is the other thing is hopefully it makes a difference. Right. Um, you know, depending on who you listen to, it might be already too far gone or we might do everything we can to just stop emitting gas. But if we can't get the rest of the world on. Right. What well, did, did we solve the problem? What and, difference did it make? And if carbon is really the killer and other gas greenhouse are the killer they are, I mean, what are we doing about re- taking it out of the environment? Right. Like stopping creating new doesn't change what's there. Right. Yeah. So, um, I think there's a lot more to this. Obviously it's a big picture. We don't pretend to have all the answers, Nope. but what I will say definitively, and you know, people can beat me up on this. EVs are going to cost you more. They're going to cost you more, right? Uh, especially 
in a, in a fleet setting that way. All right. Um, and, and that's okay. And I do think, you know, and again, the facts are the facts. They're going to reduce tail, they're going to reduce tailpipe emissions. They're going to overall reduce emissions less so than purely tailpipe. Um, but they're going to cost you more. And so anybody who's out there saying, no, 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 they're not. I, I, I just think you're not, I think you're hurting the problem. You may think that you're helping because you're helping to convince folks that they should do it. I, I don't actually think you're helping. I think you're hurting um, because then folks end up having shock when they realize all oh, that's kind of actually going into this piece, right? So um, I think the best way to solve problems is to do it honestly and with your eyes wide open and transparency. And you know, that's what we're going for. And like I said, I love my Kia. I love my uh, EV9. I would suggest everyone goes out and gets one if you can. It's the awesome thing to drive. I love being in my dad vehicle yep. and beating Camaros. Go get a Tesla. Go ahead. Like, you know, <laughs> we're, we're totally definitely pro EV. Yeah. <laughs> Just pro EV with eyes wide open. With eyes wide open. Yep. All right. Yep. That's going to wrap it for us. This was a long one today. Sorry, guys. We had slides. Yeah. And that automatically made what meant we were going to talk longer. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, by all means, if you have any questions, we'd love to hear your comments. Podcast at rtfleet.com. You can obviously comment on the YouTube video. Um, you know, would love to hear more from you about this very contentious topic. Right. Um, and, and hopefully you can think critically about your own position and, and why you have the position you do, whether it's pro, anti, pragmatic like us, you know, whatever, uh, you know, think critically about your stances on things and, and the world will be a, a better place when you do that. So right. if you want more on it too, we want to hear about that with tons more topics, what use cases seem to make sense so far, what use cases don't, we can, we can really continue to dig into this. Or if you hate us and you never want us to talk about EVs again, you can let us know. We probably won't listen to you, but, you know, hey. I would just tell you, unsubscribe. <laughs> we'll still be here producing content <laughs> for the rest of our days. <laughs> All right, y'all. Enjoy the, uh, the rest of your day, and uh, thanks for listening. Thanks, folks. Take care. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others. Post about it on LinkedIn or leave a review. Want to learn more about our fleet management software, Fleet 360? Check us out at rtafleet.com. If you want to learn more about having your fleet evaluated by our consulting team, go to fleetconsulting.com.